Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to wrap up today with a special selection, which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. Today's special selection comes at us from Brici, Simfres, Pseudo. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I don't know anything about this group. I don't think we've ever checked out Simfres before, and the name certainly isn't ringing a bell for me. Let's just dive in, figure out what's going on on this 12 and a half minute song. <sighs> The heavy breathing kind of implied something more metallic. I was expecting some screaming. This is really pleasant though, and I, I'm appreciating it. getting some frost vibes off of this already really great production beautiful layering of multiple timbres okay 2024 I was expecting something a little newer with this production this just came out this year though Fun little bass line there. Yeah, from funky to driving. The drums keep changing things up. Snare accent on 2 4, but every once in a while switch off to triplets or something like that to bring some diversity into the rhythmic pulse. Great phrasing. Start out lower on that verse, high energy chorus, bringing it back down. Nice contrast between the vocal styles too. This one being very full bodied and present. The harmonized ones being a bit more airy. Yeah, I was waiting for that, that uh, bass kick on every beat. A little chirping over here that embellished what the snare was doing. Yeah, clever. It's a very uh, fun, high energy idea. Okay, okay, polyrhythms. Yeah, very expansive on the synth kind of spacey.
<laughs> a little bit of color and outside the lines on that. Oh, they went back. Okay. Ooh. That last section was very rushy. It's interesting to hear the contrast between some of the more like 70s prog uh, harmonies, straightforward rock harmonies, and also space rock popping in, especially during that uh, guitar solo section with the synth. Yeah, so the first two times it's cut short by just a hair. The second two times it's a full 4-4. Four, four. It's even a little jazzy with its chords. I really like this kind of prog revival. There's certainly some parts that remind me of classic prog, but I think it more captures the energy of experimentation of the time. This guitar in the middle, so relaxing. The calm vocals on the outside, embellishing on that feeling. I It really would not surprise me if they started going into more of a folky style with the music. But even this right here works well. Well played. the power in that four chord movement. Yeah. Got some sort of uh, glockenspiel maybe chord maybe and bass no guitar there in that last section oh it was piano wasn't it
belts it out. about the breathing. Okay, that was a treat. Like I'd mentioned during it, this this is Prog Revival right here. And there's actually a lot in here that reminds me of older progressive rock bands. In fact, one part in particular I even called that as being very rushy. And in hindsight I probably should have said rush inspired, so it didn't seem like I was talking about the speed of it the section, but yeah. I can hear bits of King Crimson in here, a little bit of Genesis. I definitely hear the same inspirations that Frost has um, in their sort of modern take on classic prog rock. But what I really love about this is that it doesn't it doesn't necessarily wear its inspirations on its sleeve as far as direct sound comparisons or, of course, moments in here. But I think overall, this captures the mentality of prog rock more so than it captures the sonic representation of classic prog rock. And a lot of that comes down to experimentation, storytelling, um, and a willingness to put a ton of ideas into a single song from so many different different styles of music. I mean, we had some light modern classical in here. We had some semi-folk stuff. We, of course, had rock. I think there's even a little bit of metal, particularly if you look at some of the uh, faster bass kick work at, in the drum kit. At the end of the song, it was either the final or penultimate section, the drums get a little metallic. And uh, there's some jazzy ideas in here. There's, I mean, it's, it's just, it really is all over the place. And I love that. It all comes together in a way that's, well, it is disjointed a little bit. But it ends up working in the larger, larger uh, painting, larger picture. Yeah, that's the phrase I want. Which is what prog rock, classic prog rock, is typically how I, I view it. All the bands have their own flavor, their own style, their own sound, but they all are pretty big on sonic exploration, whether that's playing around with the technology of the time or incorporating different genres into the rock sound, just kind of seeing where music can take them. To me, that is not just the cornerstone, but the the main form of what classic prog rock was um and it's uh it's one of the things that causes me to create a dividing line between prog rock and progressive rock where prog rock is a specific sound of rock and progressive rock is the experimentation that you do with the rock sounds classic prog rock was progressive a lot of Retro Revival, though, just seeks to capture that prog rock sound without progressing it. This, to me, though, is progressive rock. Capturing the, the spirit of the bands that they're obviously look up, uh, look up to. 
So, let's dive into the song, explore some of what it's doing. I'm probably going to miss some details. This is a lengthy song. There's a lot of stuff in it. My memory is good, but not not that not that good. Um, first of all, the beginning of the song. I love this. Like I had mentioned, <sighs> what I interpreted originally of exasperation was actually something closer to meditation, a clearing of the mind rather than a reluctant or uh, an acceptance of a weight put on you. The ending of the song solidifies this with the uh, the breathing coming back, followed by nature sounds. This is more of a meditative type of sigh than a defeat. <sighs> okay, I'll do it. That's not what this is about. That's what it felt like. And so my mind immediately went to metal. And then we didn't get metal, and I was very happy with that. <laughs> not to say I dislike metal, but, you know, some days you just don't need to be hitting the head with the sonic sledgehammer and i'm glad that we had something a bit more uh more dexterous here with symphrus a bit of a relief i think much like the meditation might have felt for the fictional character here we have some guitars come in some light drumming Beautiful bass lines all throughout this track. Nothing too intricate, but enough to keep the song driving forward without sticking to pedal tones or copying what another instrument is doing. The bass is consistently uh, a contributing factor to the band with a unique section. Um, and this this whole opening works really well, even just in a microcosm. We have a very light opening. It builds into what I think is the first chorus, possibly. We have vocals coming in on the side. We have the center vocals. We have some strings coming in, I think. We also have the piano. Tons of layers, high energy. The drums have begun to explore some, uh, some more engaged parts. And then after the chorus, we take the energy back down. We sort of mellow it out. Just the opening... I don't know, what was that, like two and a half minutes, I think works well. And if you just shipped that as a song, it would have been solid. I would have loved it just off of that. The plethora of instruments already on display, the tasteful layering of it all, the building up of sound and naturally releasing it. It fits really well with the concept of breathing, the inhale, and the exhale. Works fantastic with the intro to the track. It's just a really great opening to a song. Uh, there's some catchy rhythms in here. There's some catchy um, vocal melodies. I had mentioned that the drums started off with something a bit funkier. There is some really intricate cymbal work in that opening verse. We push into something a bit heavier, more hard rock style for the chorus, which fits the energy of this section. The guitars also go into uh, overdrive with some distortion and we get some harder rock, lighter metal riffs from them. And uh, everything just, it clicks. It feels like a breath. It matches the intro very well and it's done in such a tasteful way. We never push too hard into the heavy. This is something also, I don't mean to keep bringing them up, but, but Frost does very well too, of creating a more metallic sound without venturing into the realm of metal, just in order to uh, touch on something a bit heavier and aggressive without allowing the song to be pulled into that darkness. And uh, Symphorus is doing a real great job of that as well here. But after these three parts, I was kind of expecting another chorus. We have a verse, and then a chorus, and then a verse. We don't really get that next chorus, though. Particularly because I don't even know that it is a chorus. It could just be three verses back to back, because I don't think we ever revisited that second uh, section. Because now that we have the breath established, we have entered meditation. And for the next, geez, what was it, like five, six minutes, we enter into a sort of stream of consciousness instrumental. 
Wherever the song takes us is just where we go. Sometimes it takes us at like the beginning of it. It starts off a bit spacier. We change up the harmonic elements. We make it a bit more open. We kind of get away from that rooted rock sound and find something more expansive, both in the range of notes used, but also the chords themselves. The harmonies that are created is one that leaves a lot of open impression. We have a little bit of guitar work here, but then we bring in the synth, and the synth tone itself feels very space rocky to me. It just kind of feels synthy or spacey in general. It has a real, a real phaser sound to it. We get some cool uh, solo writing here. Both the guitar and the synth are very tasteful. There are some places where they show off their skill a little bit, but even in those moments, it's all. For the song, for the melody itself, nothing feels out of place. Everything feels like it's designed to push the story forward. Now from here, I'll be honest, things get a little hazy as far as ordering of how things go. But we explore quite a few different sections. There's one that's a bit uh, funkier, a little jazzier even, with its chord progression. Um... We allow the strings to come back at some places. We enter into more of a, a hard rock section that has some stronger riffage to it. Uh, we have more solos. The drums are all over the place here. I, I think one of the sections in here might have been the harder rock part. We entered into some wildly eclectic um, polyrhythm in the drums. Um, this is... This is wild. We also have the folkier acoustic guitar part that I think wrapped it up. I think that was the last section to this this stream of consciousness moment. This instrumental bit. Um, all of this is beautiful though. Alright, well, I think the main takeaways I, I want you all to know about this section is that one... It's a bunch of smaller ideas that capture a specific mood and that all of the instruments are working together. Sometimes instruments are removed in order to achieve a sound such as, um, you know, that folkier aspect with a bit of the modern classical writing. You don't want an electric guitar in there. It's supposed to be chill. Oh, no, the very last section was just piano and bass, wasn't it? There was no guitar at all. So, yeah, it's it's not just about the addition of instruments, but also the removal of instruments. And also the fact that there's no guitar in that last one is pretty big. When you think about rock bands, even ones with expansive instrumentation and, and a large amount of musicians, the guitar is pretty much the last thing to ever be removed. It's a core component to every part of a song. I like that they chose for the guitar not to be present there. To me, it shows a, a good understanding of what they're trying to accomplish. That this isn't a rock band, it just happens to have a rock foundation. and So they have no problem sort of uh, dancing outside of the bounds of what rock music is. I think that's pretty cool. Um, even if you know many of the sections are uh, rock adjacent. So they create a lot of sections using different types of instrumentation to create specific vibes. But there's also a general fluidity between them all. There aren't too many places where we jump from a large amount of instruments to minimal instrumentation. It seems to be pretty generally even throughout. We just might remove two of these instruments and include these two just to change the, the sonic palette that we're working with. And so it feels even moving throughout, but there's also elements in the composition that are retained too. Ways that kind of smooth over some of the transitions from one idea to another. But the general idea between all of this is to create a fluidity of ideas. Again, I really believe this to be a type of stream of consciousness, a meditation of just allowing your mind to take you wherever it goes in a, a musical representation of that. And so there needs to be fluidity between ideas, but the ideas also need to be vastly different, just allowing free-form thought. 
And so the musical representation of this would be a plethora of styles with a loose connection between them. And I think that ends up working really well. It is a wonderful little section full of these nice little musical vignettes. The melodies and solos all to me work very well. They're, they're narratively written. They're very tasteful. Like I said, there's a little bit of showing off in some places, but it's always in service to the song, not strictly because the musician wanted to shred a little bit. And uh, it ends up, one, being a fantastic showcase of the musical knowledge of the band and their ability to not just write these... Uh, all of these different types of music uh, and combine them with a rock aesthetic at the heart of it all, but also to perform all of them in a way that feels generally authentic to the style. Some of them are more expansive, some of them are more pensive and uh, interior, some of them are more isolated, some of them are more dense uh, and, and larger, macro style. It's, uh, it's very interesting to be on that ride. I think they did a fantastic job of capturing this idea sonically. And from here we wrap the song up. We have a couple of sections that include rockier ideas. We again move into something that feels a bit jazzier. Uh, although I would say less so than the one that comes in in, in that uh, instrumental bridge. Um, and it kind of does feel like bringing everything back in a unified element. If we were thinking about all these topics, how do they work together as a whole? How can we bring parts of all of them? It's why we have that spacey synth brought back in with the expansive jazzy harmonies. Uh, the piano comes back. We have the acoustic guitar and the electric. The drums are driving. It's a little bit of everything. Different pieces pulled from all of them to create a whole. I don't know what this is supposed to mean. Maybe as the song is wrapping up and we are getting ready to have our final breath of our meditation, we're trying to bring all of our thoughts together as well. We let the mind wander. Well, what did it mean? What can we learn from our freeform thought? That's sort of what I take away from it. Um, I think we bring back some of the vocal melodies from the beginning, though, in a way to sort of wrap it up, bringing us back to where we started, because, you know, meditation is about allowing the mind to wander, but physically you never move. So kind of creating the cyclicality of ending where we started makes a lot of sense to me, but we are also different. Maybe we were stressed at the beginning of the song. That's the reason for the... Uh, the fictional character to have started the meditation maybe we're calm now there is an inner change even though physically exteriorly we haven't moved or altered our location or or anything and so this idea of looping back to the beginning with a new perspective in mind maybe that's what it's all about taking the journey and incorporating it into the music in a way that showcases change but also static of not moving and then the song wraps up nicely with just a synth drone, the two vocals with a very light, airy harmony, some bass work, and all of that fades out to the exhale, and then nature sounds all very calming. It is a fantastic way to have a sense of not necessarily pure sonic resolution, but a feeling of finality, the ending of an event. And the calm that comes after it, which is where the nature sounds come in. That's my take on all of this, but that's just the musical side of things. I want to hit the lyrics on this. See what's going on there. And see if any of my read on the song is matched at all in the vocal component. Alright, this is neat. Primarily because I don't think I've heard a song particularly about this. I'm kind of right in a lot of ways, but I'm also kind of wrong. I mentioned that the initial exhale it felt like a defeat to me until the music came in and retroactively changed my interpretation of it. It actually is 
an exhale of defeat, though. The band describes this song as a modern take on the apology of Socrates, as presented by Plato. It captures the final moments of Socrates right before he is forced to drink the hemlock. This song features a children's choir. I forgot about the children's choir. That was, uh, that was an unexpected addition to the song. Right after the exhale, we have the line, After so many years, broken chains and lights of the real, and uh, actually an allusion to the allegory of the cave. So I think that's pretty cool. It says, I to die and you to live. Your eyes were throbbing for the sun. How can you cry again for a shadow ending its reign? I think this is interesting. I don't think I've ever read this apology from Socrates, and I'd say that this is not just a modern interpretation of it, but I think even the words themselves have been very modernized. But I think it, it works perfectly for this. There is a chorus, and in fact, we see it three times. The song is verse, chorus, verse, chorus, instrumental bridge, verse, chorus, outro. It follows the ABABCB pattern. I think that's pretty cool. The The C, of course, is rather linear, going through like six or seven different sections. You're welcome to break that up if you like, but at least for me, it makes sense to compartmentalize that as the bridge. It's just a very expansive bridge, but we end up coming out of it and revisiting a verse with the children's choir and a final chorus, which I don't remember musically if that was new or not. So there might be uh, a musical structure to the song that differs from the standard structure that we find in the, the vocals, the lyrics. But anyways, we have Socrates ready to be put to death. And he's humble about it. And it even says, the chorus says, Barefoot and humble, I played my role. I fought to make sure that life itself is whole. Stop embracing the emptiness and smash your mind into the eyelid, whose lashes keep star-like beauty safe from indifference. Basically says that I've, I've tried to get people to think outside the box. And I hope that you'll continue to do that. That you don't embrace emptiness, that you go look for what makes the world tick, even after I'm dead. I really like, too, the third verse after the instrumental part. He mentions that he hopes that his son, yeah, his sons, will also break their chains of the fire cave, bringing the allegory back once again. But he also hopes that people continue to think like he did and question life and search for answers. But I love this right at the very end. He says, what is wisdom? Except our life is a hue of indifferent states of ignorance. That's beautiful. The idea that wisdom is simply being less ignorant than you were yesterday. A different shade than you were prior to right now. You can never know it all. You can never honestly be intelligent or wise. You can just be more knowledgeable than you were last week. And I love that sentiment. I think it works really well. The final stanza of the song says, My legs are heavy. I'm not afraid to go. Is it worse or not? Only gods can know. Even at the very end, philosophically questioning, is being afraid of death or not a better way to live? Wonderful. Now, bringing us back to the music. Again, the exhale is one of defeat. Socrates knows this is his last moments on earth. 
And he's taking the time to have his final few thoughts. He expresses some and keeps others to himself, which is how I interpret the bridge. It is still a stream of consciousness moment, but it's more of maybe life flashing before his eyes, him thinking about some of the high parts of his life, maybe the low parts, maybe pondering some more questions, trying to be a little more wise, a little less ignorant in his final moments. It might have even been some philosophical musings that led him to the final section of the song, questioning wisdom, what it is. And finally, he comes to acceptance. He doesn't fear death. He's ready to go. He takes one final breath and drinks the hemlock. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. I kind of like my idea a little better of my, you know, my interpretation on just the music. Um, you know, the, the death of a, a famous person is not usually something I like to dwell on too much. And the music is a bit brighter through it. But I think it does a great job of capturing Socrates' outlook on life. Um, and does a great job at sonically personifying his final few moments absolutely fantastic job it isn't just great music it's a great understanding of a historical person and doing a great job at using music to convey who they were beautiful if you've made it this far and somehow you're a prog rock fan and you're like i don't know about that i'm just going to tell you go listen to the album it came out in february there's six tracks five tracks it's 37 minutes. That's real short for a prog album, actually. Um, each song gets progressively shorter, too. 12, 9, 8, 5, 2. <laughs> uh, I'm going to throw this in my list and list, though. I mean, 37 minutes, that's nothing. I mean, honestly, that's one of the problems I have with a lot of prog rock is that I love the moment-to-moment -moment stuff. But, uh, dude... And, you know, I understand the irony of this, but prog rock musicians are quite verbose and lengthy in what they're trying to do. Double albums, two hour long explorations, it's, they're very long winded. Again, I see the irony of saying that. But this is what I want. This is what I look forward to. I want the prog rock experience in a more, a, a tighter, condensed idea and this might be it for me. They have 100 monthly listeners. If you like this song, please go listen to them. Try to bump those numbers up, especially if you enjoy it. These are my thoughts on Symphrys' Pseudo. Let me know what you thought of this track. If there's anything that stood out to you, anything that you would like to add on to what I said, or correct me on, maybe just have your own thoughts, opinions, and perspective about this song, put all that stuff down in the comments section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, that wraps it up for... I accidentally hit that a little early. That wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC as usual. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.